Now, uh, there's a major cluster of psalms that talk about the king. Now, first question, I suppose, would be, why is the king so important in these psalms? Yeah, we have to remember something that we, we often miss as we think about how the monarchy worked in, in ancient Israel. We tend to separate the monarchy from what's going on in the temple, which the Bible sort of suggests that we should in many, in many places, really wants to keep, if you read Leviticus, there's no mention of, of the king. But it's clear from the rest of the ancient world that in fact, you didn't have a cult without royal uh, promotion and involvement and support. Patronage. We have to remember that there's a reason the temple was built directly next to the palace in, in Jerusalem, right? That Solomon's palace was directly next to Solomon's temple. This was the royal cult, right? Uh, and the king was not only the patron, but as far as we can tell from near, uh, other Near Eastern cultures, was probably actively involved in, in the cult. I'm thinking of numerous Ugaritic texts, Canaanite yeah. texts, that prescribe the offerings that the king would make. So we don't want to separate at all the role of king from the role of really probably leader of, of the cult in some sense. So it, this, this sort of explains why there are psalms that look like they're written for the king. Right? They're, they're honor, honoring their royal patron. Indeed. Now, and the reason then why you have large segments of the Hebrew Bible where the king disappears from the picture is that after the Babylonian exile, they didn't have a king. Right. And so uh, the high priest would eventually come to the fore. And even in the book of Ezekiel, when they're pre painting a picture of uh, the ideal Jerusalem in the future, uh, the king is really reduced. Yeah. He just becomes the prince whose job is to provide the sacrifices. So one of the things then that's so interesting about the royal Psalms is they give us a glimpse of the old time religion before the, the exile. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly say that Psalms that talk about and honor the king must come from a period when there was a king, which is, is nice because we can, we can pretty much date yeah. these to, to the pre-exilic period. And as you say, they also uh, give us insight into the conceptual background of, of the king's place in sort of the divine, the divine sphere. One of the interesting things about the Bible generally is even though we see allusions to uh, sort of a royal ideology, right, a, a theology of kingship, right, how the king relates to the deity, you see this in Samuel a little bit, it's never really explicitly stated. What we have in the Royal Psalms is I think as close as we come to a sort of very open picture of how the king was understood to fit into the relationship of God to Israel, God to the king, and, and, and how the king functioned as something of an intermediary uh, between God and, and the people, a representative. Let's look at a couple of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one you meet in the Psalter is Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. His anointed, of course, is his Mashiach, the word that gives us Messiah. Mm -hmm. But the reference here is not to a future figure, it's to the actual king of the day. And the nations say, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will tell you the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. And it goes on then to warn the kings of the earth about the dire things that will happen to them if they question the authority of Yahweh's king in Jerusalem. Yeah, there's so much, so much wrapped up in there. The most striking image surely is the king as God's 
son. Indeed. This is an idea that I think often we would tend to associate with other Near Eastern traditions. I mean, Egypt, for example, in which the the king was understood as some as a deity or, or somehow you know deified. Yeah. Mesopotamia also similar similar sorts of traditions, but here we have exactly that notion in Israel. Uh, not only not only a, a child through adoption, which is a, a formula we, we yes. regularly see. That is, God ad adopts David, for example. That's one of the a, a regularly a, a reasonably common trope. But my begotten. Right, uh, which is really taking the role of king to a place that you almost never see it anywhere else in the Bible. Right, the, the king right. brought up to that it, height. It's really just a few passages in the Psalter. Mm -hmm. How do you think they arrived at that kind of idea of, 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 of the, the king. king as being begotten by God? The prime example of it would be in Egypt. Yes. And this back in the centuries when Egypt was ruling over Jerusalem. Right. And uh, so I think that there is a reasonable ground for suspicion that this idea actually came into the tradition way back then, mm -hmm. and that it was part of the Canaanite kingship in Jerusalem, and that this just evolved and was taken on in the, in the royal cult. Because as you underlined, it is, a, it is not adoption. It's begetting. Now, of course, when they say that the king is begotten by God, they're not suggesting that the king's mother was a virgin. Although this is the kind that, of psalm that, that can get used very it, easily. It is very much so. And the fact then that the king is here called the Mashiach or the Messiah uh, is really, I think, the root of the idea that the Messiah is son of God which would come to be a very important idea in Christianity. Right. Of course, that, what we see here is simply the widespread understanding that the king gets anointed as part of the process of, of crowning him, right? This well, is, indeed. Now, uh, he said some people have suggested that this actually would be part of a coronation ceremony. Right. Again, thinking about that, what the setting of such a, a psalm would be, that's one possibility. There's also... I would assume you would see semi-regular royal involvement in the cult, if not on a daily basis, then I'm, I'm sure annually. Uh, we certainly have from other Near Eastern cultures, we have the annual celebration of the king becoming, becoming yeah. king. Uh, so once a year on coronation day, as it were, that you would this, see another celebration this might like be that. celebrated. Uh, but you get this idea also in the Egyptian texts that the king, you know, the king presumably is actually the son of the god, but this is only recognized or acknowledged when he actually ascends to the throne. Mm -hmm. Because if he doesn't ascend to the throne, you don't need to believe that he's the son of God, I right. suppose. Uh, but so there is a connection with that. There's only one other psalm, I think, that uses this begetting language, and even then the text is corrupt. And so it's an interesting one. It's Psalm 110, mm -hmm. where the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And uh, a little bit further into it, but the, the, I'm reading here from the NRSV translation, uh, on the day you lead your forces on the holy mountain, from the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you which doesn't make a lot of sense a, in Hebrew. And the word that's translated, your youth, uh, could be pointed differently mm -hmm. in the Hebrew. And the Greek actually translates it, I have begotten you. And so the suspicion is that what you actually had in this psalm was a statement of how God had begotten the king and dew had something to do with it, <laughs> at least. Now that there is a, an Egyptian inscription where the goddess says to the, the god, your dew is in all my limbs. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly the same usage of it here, but dew was thought to be life-giving. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, with all of these, what you see 
what, what I think is so striking is, uh, as I said, the, the elevation of the king in the eyes of God. Most of what we see about, with, to do with kings, as we read through, for example, the book of Kings, is mostly to do with God judging the kings as to whether or not they yes. obeyed the Torah yeah. or whether or not they followed the law. That's a very critical understanding of, of kingship. What we have in these Psalms is sort of from the, from the royal perspective uh, in a way that we don't get, don't get elsewhere. And what you see is the kings really thinking of themselves or at least the king, you know, the 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 king's priests, the uh, the the royal servants, viewing the king in this uh, almost non almost non biblical way. Yes. I mean, it, it is an elevation of the king that uh, I think most of the prophets would not really have approved of. Certainly, so certainly Deuteronomy a, wouldn't approve, approve of. Yeah. Would, uh, you know, Deuteronomy, which, which really pushes, uh, yeah. pushes the king down. Uh, the, this, what makes these so valuable for, for a historical understanding of the Bible is they, they are these small windows into what may really have been, have been going on, as opposed to the way that uh, sort of more critical authors sort of tried to constrain the kingship. Yes. Now, it's, a, I think, a rather nice psalm in Psalm 45, which actually seems to be a poem composed for a royal wedding. And you may think, what's that doing in the middle of the Psalter? But it goes like this. Uh, my heart overflows with a goodly theme. I address my verses to the king. So this is the court poet, if you like. Mm -hmm composing um, a poem for his majesty on his wedding day. How do you begin? You are the most handsome of men, and grace is poured out on your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. In your majesty, ride on triumphant. Uh, your throne, O God, endures forever. Your royal scepter is a scepter of equity. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. How many gods are we talking about here? Right. Uh, I mean, what you can see, again, is this sort of notion of a personal relationship between the king and the deity. Yeah. Right? Your, whether it is father-son, whether it is, is you know, God being your God specifically, the notion of the king always having been personally chosen one way or the other, is one that, 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 that permeates. You see it also in, in, yes. even in Deuteronomy, right? If, you are, if in time to come you choose a king, Deuteronomy says, somebody who I approve of, right? somebody yeah. who I choose. You see that here. You also see in that psalm, I think, the, what we were, have talked about already, which is the parallel between the king as sort of justice giver yes. and, and the deity, right? that the king manifests God's justice That's on right. earth. Yes, the king is the human manifestation of the God. But the, the controversial verse here is the one that says, your throne, O God, endures forever. Now, there have always been and still are scholars who will argue that that should be your divine throne, meaning the throne that God has given you. But the fact that it comes back a verse later and says, therefore, God, your, your God, God shows you the possibility of confusion yeah. here. The king is not on a par with the Most High, but he is an Elohim. Mm -hmm. He's not on a par with regular human beings either. Right. And this is a kind of veneration of the kingship that you just would not get in the later parts of the Hebrew Bible. Right. In fact, one of the shifts that I think we see, even within the Psalms, is it is from this sort of absolute veneration, enduring forever, right, the throne, your throne endures, to the later notion that, in light of certainly of the loss of kingship, the notion that there's a conditionality to this, this relationship, right? That whereas in the early period, the king is God's son, the king is, the throne will endure forever, but later on, a, a, a growing recognition that, in fact, perhaps that wasn't as as absolute a promise as it seemed. As it seemed. 